Chapter One of The Haunted Hangar by Van Powell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter One Suspicious Sandy. Steady all. Engines quittin' left us with a dead stick. No danger neither sixteen-year-old larry turner nor dick summers a year his junior had any more fear than had sandy mclaren hardly thirteen and seated just back of the pilot who in flying the four-place low-wing airplane had called back reassuringly jeff's a war ace and knows his stuff larry mused and the engine couldn't have died in a better spot we are high enough and within gliding distance of that old abandoned private field dick who saw something to make light of in any situation turned with his plump face cracked by a broad grin i always said whether you fly a crate full of passengers or handle one full of eggs you get a good break sometimes larry nodded in his calm half-serious way only the youngest member of the trio as the craft nosed into a gentle glide and banked in a turn to get in position to shoot the private landing spot on the old estate took the occasion as anything but a lark dick joked larry admired the skill of the pilot and jeff chewing his gum casually justified their confidence sandy mclaren with narrowed eyes and an intent frown bent his gaze on the pilot's back and muttered under his breath that engine didn't die i saw what jeff did he was as quick as a cat but he didn't fool me his expression altered to a puzzled scowl but why did he shut off the ignition and pretend the engine had stopped so handy to this old abandoned estate no answer rewarded his agile thoughts as jeff skilfully shot the small field compelled to come in to one side because of tall trees directly in their line of flight over which his dead engine made it impossible to manoeuvre nor did he get a solution to his puzzle as jeff cleverly side-slipped to lose momentum and to get over the neglected turf-grown runway down which a little bumpily but right side up he taxied to a standstill well jeff said with a grin swinging around in his seat and drawing off his helmet here we are if i ever get the money to take flying lessons larry said i know the pilot i'm going to ask to give me instruction when i can make a forced landing like that one jeff i'll think i'm getting to be a pilot if ever i get taken into my uncle's airplane passenger line dick spoke up i know who'll be chief pilot until larry gets the experience to crowd jeff out sandy his face moody said nothing the tall slim pilot grinned at the compliments and then went on working his jaws on the gum he habitually chewed guess i'll have to trace my gas line and ignition to see if a break made this trouble jeff began removing his leather coat say by golly do you know where i think we've set down yes sandy spoke meaningly this is the old everdale estate the one that's been in the newspapers lately because the people around here claim the hangar is haunted i believe it is agreed jeff why don't you three take a look yonder's a hangar and the roll door is lifted a little maybe you'd spot that there mr spook and clear up the mystery while i work i'd rather go down by the water and see if it's cooler there sandy said trying to catch larry's eye since we got down out of the cool air it's the hottest day this june i'm for the hangar voted dick if there's any spectres roaming through that hangar you'll get more chills there than you will by the sound i could stand a shiver or two commented larry leading the way toward the large metal-sheathed building at the end of the runway facing them was a wide opening sufficiently spacious to permit airplanes to be rolled through in grooved slots at either side the door made of joined metal slats working like the old-fashioned roll-top desk could be raised or lowered by a motor and cable led over a drum sandy gave in and as they walked toward the hangar they discussed the stories that had come out in the news about queer ghostly noises heard by passers-by on the state road late at night accounts of the fright the estate caretaker had received when he investigated 
and saw a queer bluish glow in the place and was attacked by something seemingly uncanny and not human the door when they arrived was seen to be partially open lifted about three feet there's an airplane in there it looks to be an amphibian i see pontoons larry stated let's go have a look at it suggested dick don't sandy spoke sharply don't go in there larry and dick straightened and stared in surprise it was very plain to be seen that sandy was not joking why asked larry in his practical way think back said sandy when school vacation started and we began to stay around the new lloyd bennett airport that had opened on barren island jeff had his crate there to take people around the sky for short sightseeing hops didn't he yes admitted larry and we got to be friendly because we are crazy to be around airplanes and pilots and jeff let us be grease monkeys and help him get passengers too surely he did but when we brought them to go up with him did he take their money and fly them around the way others did or no dick admitted he generally had something wrong with the crate or the wind was too high or he had stubbed his left foot and met a cross-eyed girl or saw a funeral passing and thought something unlucky might happen from those signs do you really believe anybody can be as superstitious as jeff tries to make us believe he is yes lots of pilots are they think an accident will happen if anybody wears flowers in their planes all right larry let that go but why did jeff bring us here he said this morning we had helped him a lot and he didn't have money to pay us larry answered he offered us a joyride but why did he come so far out on long island and then get a dead stick so handy to this old estate that hasn't been lived in for years and that has everybody scared so they won't come near at night then get a dead stick larry shook his head why sandy i know you read detective stories until you think everything is suspicious so do you read them and dick too but we read to try to guess the answers to the mystery dick declared you've got the idea that real life is like those wild stories everything looks as if it had some hidden mystery behind it i know what will be your new nickname he chuckled to show there was no malice as he stated the new name suspicious sandy that's good larry smiled suspicious sandy thinks a pilot gets a dead stick to make us land near a haunted hangar i saw him cut the ignition switch declared sandy defiantly you thought you did i know i did and what's more here we are at a spot where nobody comes because of the ghost story and he tells us to go into the hangar and the door is left up a little way oh sandy you're letting wild imagination run away with you am i all right you two go on in and be held for ransom <laughs> that's good suspicious sandy is that somebody inside the hangar dick changed his tone suddenly dropping his voice to a whisper as he stooped and saw something move behind the old amphibian at the back of the building i thought i saw but it's gone larry retorted lowering his voice also by a common impulse of curiosity they stooped and went in sandy his own impulse following theirs was inside almost as quickly there isn't anybody larry's eyes became used to the duller light that filtered through the thick dust on the roof skylight to their startled ears came a muffled clang a queer hollow sound and as they turned to run back under the rolled-up door it slid rapidly down in its grooves dropping into place with a hollow rumble good gracious golly gasped dick that's queer larry was a little puzzled sandy half frightened half triumphant spoke four words i told you so he whispered End of chapter one Chapter Two of The Haunted Hangar by Van Powell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Two Ghosts, Gum, and Gems. For a long minute, Dick, 
larry and sandy stood in a compact group feeling rather stunned by the sudden springing of the trap as they considered the closed hangar larry calm and cool in any emergency was first to recover even if jeff did want to catch us and demand ransom to let us go he remarked quietly he wasn't outside that rolling door and i don't think he could pull it down anyhow no dick agreed seeing no fun in the situation for once see there is a motor connected to a big drum up in the top of the hangar and the door is counterbalanced so that turning the drum winds up the cable that pulls it up i suppose the motor reverses to run it down and what was that sandy's voice was tense and strained they heard the strange hollow sound again seeming to come from the metal wall but impossible to locate at once because of the echo rap tap tap somebody's knocking dick gasped not somebody something corrected sandy the same something that worked the door and shut it gracious to gravy exclaimed larry you don't believe in ghosts do you sandy not really no human hand touched the switch that ran that door down i think it did challenged larry we thought we saw somebody at the back of the hangar that's why we came in i'm going to see where he is what he's doing and why he's trying to fright frighten us he broke his sentence in the middle of a word because the queer knocking repeated itself but with quick presence of mind he completed his phrase to steady sandy whose face was growing drawn with dismay larry took a swift sharp look around the enclosure there's a big closed can for waste and oily rags he commented but anyone would suffocate who'd hidden that well there's a clothes cupboard in the back corner dick said let's look in that you and i sandy you stay back and keep watch dick quick to see larry's attitude toward sandy wanted to have a dependable chum at his side as he investigated while he hoped to give sandy more confidence by leaving him in the lighted part of the building under the smudged dusty skylight come on agreed larry with dick he walked boldly enough to the built-in wooden cupboard protected from dust by a heavy burlap hanging throwing the curtain aside sharply both youths peered in nothing but old overalls and some tools on the floor dick commented it's peculiar larry said doubtfully nobody here but a new idea struck him quietly he gestured toward the amphibian old uncared for looking almost ready to fall apart its doped wings stained with mold its pontoons looking as if the fabric was rotting on them dick instantly catching larry's notion went to the forward seat while larry took the second compartment behind the big fuel tank nobody here he reported and investigated by climbing in the vacant part of the fuselage toward the tail this place is empty too dick agreed where could oh sandy almost screamed the word as the dull hollow knocks came again larry leapt from the wind step sent his sharp gaze rapidly around the enclosure and of a sudden gripped dick's arm so tightly that the plump youth winced and grew chilly with apprehension at once he saw larry's amazed relieved expression and followed the older comrade's eyes with an instant return of his old amused self he threw back his head and let out a deep howl of delight oh <laughs> oh my <laughs> what's the matter with you demanded sandy have you gone silly oh <laughs> suspicious sandy <laughs> larry explained you got us all worked up and worried he told sandy with your suspicions and all the time <laughs> all the time we were like mice racing around a treadmill dick had to speak between chuckles all the time we ran around in circles so fast we didn't see the end of the cage Su suspicious sandy thinking we would be trapped and held for ransom oh golly me look around you sandy sandy looked his face slowly changed gradually became red oh his voice was sheepish you mean the switch for the motor over by that small metal door they use when they don't want to run up the big one 
that runs the motor larry agreed the cable must have slipped on the drum and let the door go down but sandy clung obstinately to his theories why did jeff pick this haunted place and cut the ignition and why was the door up in the first place what do we care dick chuckled another thing if the electric current is off and the motor doesn't work look at that small hinged door do you see that knob of the spring lock is on our side he broke out in a fresh cackle of laughter but those wraps for a reply larry strode over to the metal door set in the wall for use when anyone chose to enter or leave the hangar throwing it open he faced jeff took you long enough to answer grumbled jeff what made you fool with that door and shut yourselves in what made you cut the ignition snapped sandy working on the idea he had read in so many detective stories that a surprise attack often caused a person to be so startled as to reveal facts larry and dick turned their eyes to jeff the older pilot staring at his accuser for an instant as though hesitating about some sharp response suddenly began to chuckle Th that there is one on me he admitted you must have mighty quick eyes i don't miss much sandy said meaningly none of us do dick caught the spirit of sandy's accusing manner i know you've been here before too there are lots of chunks of old chewing gum stuck around in that front compartment of the amphibian and someone has been working on it too i saw the signs chewing gum jeff was startled swiftly he strode across the dimly sunlit floor got into the forward step peered into the cockpit that there certainly is queer he commented you're right gum is stuck every place wads of it and you chew gum snapped sandy unwilling to be left out of the suddenly developing third degree he had begun jeff made a further inspection touched a bit of the dried gum curiously stepped down and stood with a thoughtful face for a moment presently he walked to an old soap-box holding metal odds and ends washers bolts and so on this he upended he sat down his lean jaws working as he chewed his own gum slowly around him like three detectives watching the effect of a surprise accusation stood the chums presently jeff looked up at them looks bad this here don't it he grinned dick larry and sandy were silent i guess i'd better explain jeff decided i didn't think you was so suspicious and quick or i'd have done different you can't trap us challenged sandy trap you well didn't you make friends with us and let us work on your crate and help get passengers that you never took up didn't you say you'd give us a joy ride then come straight here cut out your ignition and make believe you had a dead stick land and then try to get us into this haunted hangar sandy ran out of breath and stopped i do think you ought to explain larry said quietly yes i did all that and i guess i will explain i meant to anyhow or i wouldn't have brought you here they waited neither convinced nor satisfied fixing accusing eyes on sandy jeff spoke i never dreamed you'd be suspicious of me i made friends with you all and tried you out to be sure you were dependable and honest and all that and i did bring you to this place because it is so far from telephones and railroads but i didn't think you'd get the wrong idea i only wanted you in a place it would take time to get away from if you refused to help me help you help you with what speaking seriously jeff replied to larry's challenge help me save the most valuable set of emeralds in the world from being destroyed End of chapter two chapter three of the haunted hangar by van powell this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter three the sky patrol organizes amazed dick challenged jeff's statement priceless emeralds destroyed you mean robbers don't you jeff shook his head 
i don't think so but i don't know for sure who it is but i do mean to ask you if you'd like to help me and i don't think it would be against robbers but against somebody that wants to destroy the everdale emeralds the everdale emeralds larry repeated the phrase sharply why jeff i've read a newspaper story about them in a sunday supplement that's the match set of thirty emeralds curiously cut stones interrupted sandy i read about them too that's the ones match stones and priceless added larry the paper said they were a present to one of mr everdale's ancestors by one of the most fabulously rich hindu nabobs who ever lived but who would want to destroy them dick wondered that there is just what i can't tell you jeff replied how did you get into this sandy's suspicions came uppermost jeff drew a bulky registered envelope from his coat displayed the registration stamps and marks and his name and address typed on the envelope drawing out a half dozen handwritten sheets in a large masculine fist he showed the signature of atley everdale at the end this here is what got me going he stated want to read it or will i give it to you snappy and quick sandy extended his hand and jeff readily surrendered the letter i'm letting you see i am straight with you he remarked you said we couldn't get away to tell anybody anyway sandy said but he was compelled to admit to himself that although anyone might write such a letter even jeff the postmark was los angeles and the enclosure had every appearance of sincerity never mind old suspicious sandy urged dick let him read that but you tell us it will check up that way too smiled larry suits me jeff crossed his legs leaning against the metal wall as he related an amazing and mystifying series of events i'm pretty close to one of the richest men in america he began you see we both enlisted in aviation units when the big war tore loose and got uncle sam mixed up in it we were buddies adley and me well after we came back i stayed in aviation knocking around from control jobs to designing new gadgets like superchargers and all but when he went to california and began to organize some passenger flying lines i stayed east in a commercial pilot's job this letter starts off as if you were old friends sandy had to admit buddies closer and brothers nodded jeff atley everdale sold out stocks and stuff here and went west to work out some pet ideas about passenger transport he told dick and larry of course he bought a big place out there and closed up this estate put it up for sale hard times kept it from selling the same reason made him hang on to that there swell yacht he owned i've seen pictures of the tramp dick nodded one fine boat she is that jeff agreed well as sandy must be reading about where he's got in that letter mrs everdale who goes in for society pretty strong got a chance to be presented this spring before the king and queen of england at one of their receptions that's a big honor commented larry naturally she dug up all her finest jewelry surmised dick and how jeff nodded now that there everdale necklace that was in his side of the family for generations that wasn't took out of the safe deposit box once in a lifetime hardly most generally the missus wore a good paste imitation but to appear before royalty dick cut in it says here she took the real necklace on the yacht when she went to england said he had lost his suspicious look his interest as much as that of his older chums was caught and chained by the coming possibilities and he put down the letter to listen to jeff she did take the string as the letter says jeff nodded it was a secret they didn't broadcast it that the necklace was in the captain's cabin locked up in his safe nobody knew it not even the lady's personal maid as far as anybody supposed mr everdale didn't go with her guessed larry he was too busy routing airlines and working out cost maintenance and operation plans for his big western lines explained jeff but they took all the care in the world of those emeralds even on the night of the reception 
the imitation string was taken to the hotel mrs everdale stayed at that there real necklace was brought to the hotel in person by the captain i don't see what could happen did anything happen that there is what started things jeff told dick the missus was in her private suite in the dressing boudoir or whatever it is with nobody but her french maid to help and all the jewels in a box in the room hid in her trunks what happened sandy could hardly check his eagerness to learn she was all but ready dolled up like a circus i guess jeff grinned and then became very sober all the jewelry was spread out to try how this and that one looked with her clothes separate and in different combinations but what happened persisted sandy there comes a bangin on that there sweet door to the hall and a voice hollered like it was scared to death fire fire get out at once didn't she suspect any trick was there a trick she didn't have time to think that french maid went crazy and started to hop around like a flea in a hot pan and yelling and it upset the missus so much she forgot all about a fire escape on the end window of the suite and rushed out snatching up all the strings of beads and pearls and the pins she could carry but because she knew it was only imitation and there wasn't anybody else around anyway she didn't bother about the emerald necklace it was a false alarm there was no fire larry decided all she found was a paper of burnt matches outside in the hotel corridor that had been set off so when she opened the door she'd smell smoke of course she ran back and as he reached for the letter and searched on the fourth page all three of his listeners were holding their breath in suspense here it is he declared and they crowded around read it so you'll see just what i learned about when she went back bending close intent and eager they read some strong pungent liquid had been poured on the green necklace the letter from the millionaire stated no alarm was given my wife did not want to broadcast either the fact that she had the real gems or the trouble in the hotel but people had heard the fire cry and doubtless some suspected the possible truth knowing why she was getting ready captain parks came up later with the real stones and while he waited for my wife to finish her costume he examined the fire escape window and was sure that someone had entered and left by that now jeff the letter concluded my caretaker on long island has sent me clippings about a ghost scare on the old estate and somehow i connect that with the attempt to destroy the emeralds i can't imagine any motive but there are fanatics who do such things from a warped sense of their duty or from spite and hatred of rich folks for old time's sake drop everything get down to bedrock on this thing at your end do whatever you think best but get in touch with the yacht learn their plans cooperate with captain parks and my wife to bring that necklace back to the vaults and i count on you golly gracious exclaimed larry that's like a mystery novel but it's no novel jeff said morosely what have you done about it asked larry jeff explained he had sent a radiogram to the yacht and as its owner had already sent one identifying jeff he was given the information that the real necklace was being brought back extra heavily insured in a london company by the captain himself i located and rented this crate we flew here in he went on i played joyride pilot by day at the airport and hopped here of nights but i couldn't get a line on anything i didn't notice that chewing gum until you dick larry and sandy all of you started your third degree and showed it to me but i did think if anybody was playing ghost here they might be planning to use the old amphibian for something maybe to get away to get away with the emeralds if they could get hold of them in case anybody thought the yacht was due to lay up here and that's why you brought us here to help your watch sandy asked not exactly but it came over me that at night i didn't get anywhere and i thought i'd try coming in the daytime and being that the yacht is due to make long island this afternoon i thought i might need some help with a plan i've worked out what is it eagerly sandy wanted details 
i've sent the caretaker here he's as dependable as sunrise to a place out near montauk point lighthouse with mr everdale's fast hydroplane boat and i've sent a radio message to the yacht captain to be on the watch to meet the hydroplane pretty well out to sea and transfer the necklace to the boat then the yacht will come on and make harbor here as though nothing had happened and all the time the emeralds will be on the way down the sound and east river to a wharf where i'll have a motor-car with a dependable chum of mine to take charge and carry the package to safe deposit get a receipt and there you are i still don't see how we can help sandy spoke again i mean to hop out in the airplane sort of oversee the business of the transfer and escort the hydroplane till she lands the emeralds and then circle around till my friend with the receipt goes up on to the bank roof it's pretty high up fourteen stories and wigwags and okay and i'd like dependable observers i'm one cried sandy his suspicion swept away number two is named larry dick is a dependable third we'll be a regular sky patrol exulted sandy and watch what goes on while you do the control job and that way nothing can go wrong not with a sky patrol overseeing dick too spoke over confidently end of chapter three chapter four of the haunted hangar by van powell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter four mystery over the ocean the three youths thrilled by the prospect of a mysterious adventure and a war pilot intent on a friendly service discussed plans for protecting the everdale emeralds i don't see how anything can slip up larry gave his opinion i don't know jeff spoke dubiously uncertainly we've gone over all the things we can think of that might go wrong but but what demanded dick i had a fortune teller read the cards for me jeff told him the nine of spades the worst card of warning in the pack was right over me and that means trouble and the ace of spades a bad card crickety christmas larry was amazed are you telling us you believe in all that i've seen that there card fortune work out before you've twisted things that happened to fit what you wanted to believe argued larry oh well jeff did not want to discuss his superstitions maybe it won't come out so bad i met a pair of colored twins yesterday that's a good luck sign look here dick began to chuckle we've got a queer combination to work with our sky patrol has suspicious sandy and superstitious jeff sandy grinned ruefully a little sheepishly larry smiled and shook his head warning dick not to carry his sarcasm any further as jeff frowned how will you know when the yacht is due larry asked i fixed up atley's old shortwave radio in the old house and i've been getting dope from the yacht the last couple of nights in about an hour we'll take off fly out beyond the lighthouse and patrol we have enough gas larry inquired had some delivered in cans early this morning down at the boathouse jeff told him we can fill up the main tank and get a reserve in my small wing tanks enough for ten hours altogether let's get busy urged sandy the three comrades were busy from then on only when jeff was warming up the engine checking carefully on his instruments taking every precaution against any predictable failure was there time for a moment together and alone now what do you think of your suspicions dick demanded sandy shook his head most of the time i think i was letting imaginitis get the best of me but every once in a while i wonder for one thing why doesn't the yacht sail right on to the new york wharf and let the captain take those emeralds to safe deposit golly to goodness you're right at that larry nodded his head for another thing sandy went on anybody could write that letter jeff showed me and who is jeff when all is said and done oh i think he's all right argued larry well then let that go 
but he chews gum and there's gum stuck all over in this amphibian he's been here nights suspicion may be all right larry commented but what does it bring out sandy what is your idea this is my idea nothing is what it seems to be jeff pretends to be a joyride pilot but he never takes up passengers hardly ever the engine dies only it's jeff stopping the juice this old amphibian crate looks as though it's ready to come to pieces and yet somebody has been working on it that chewing gum wasn't stale and hard because i made sure well suppose that jeff was in a gang of international jewel robbers next you'll be saying the letter was in a registered envelope from california and was written in cairo laughed dick or in new york corrected sandy meaningly jewel robbers larry was serious i don't think that holds water sandy first of all jeff claims to know that the emerald imitations had acid poured on them acid to destroy them that must be some chemical that corrodes or eats emeralds now robbers wouldn't why not sandy was stubborn suppose they had gone to all that trouble to get into the suite and discover the false emeralds what would you do i might rip them apart but do you think robbers carry acids along to eat up emeralds if they think they are going to profit by taking them suspicious sandy dick began to chant a rhyme he invented on the spur of the moment suspicious sandy suspicious sandy he thinks everything is like april fool candy nothing is what it seems to be and soon he'll suspect both larry and me sandy turned away hurt and strolled to the amphibian with its retractable wheels for land use and its pontoons for setting down on water jeff called and signaled that all was ready larry summoned sandy but the latter lingered while dick a little sorry he had taught it so much followed larry toward the waiting airplane but sandy scowling hesitated whether he would go or be angry and refuse to join the sky patrol then as he clambered on to the forward bracing of the underwing and leaned on the cockpit cowling his face assumed a startled intent expression there was no chewing gum in the craft his first impulse was to rush out and declare his discovery his next was to keep silent and avoid further taunting jeff chews gum he mused he pretended not to know any was in this amphibian but it's gone well he told himself i'll watch and see what he's up to he'll give himself away yet assuming an air of having forgotten all about dick's rhyme he went to his place in the seat behind jeff and the instant his safety belt was snapped jeff signaled to a farmer who had come over to investigate and satisfy himself that the airplane had legitimate business there the farmer kicked the stones used as chocks from under the landing tires and jeff opened up the throttle with wind unchanged the trees which had complicated their landing were behind them jeff's only problem larry saw was to get the craft heavier with its wing tanks full off the short runway and over the hangar if he gets a dead stick here larry mused it will be just too bad he had no trouble lifting the craft and flying for seconds just above the ground to get flying speed after the takeoff, then giving it full gun and roaring up at a safe angle to clear the obstruction. We're off, exulted Dick. They were off on an adventure that was to start with a mad race and terminate in smoke. Down the backbone of Long Island, not very high, they flew the farms landscaped estates and straight roads of the central zone were in striking contrast to the bay and inlet dented north shore with its fleets of small boats its fishing hamlets rolling hills and curving motor drives and the seaside with its beach resorts yellow-brown sand and tall marsh grass clustered between crab-infested salt-water channels passing over the fashionable summer homes of wealthy people at southampton they held the course until montauk point light was to the left of the airplane then jeff swung in a wide circle out over the desolate sand dunes the ooze and waving eelgrass of marshes 
and the tossing combers of the surf there's the hydroplane dick leaning over the left side made a pointing gesture larry watching seaward had not been looking in the right direction sandy alert to pass signals touched jeff and received a nod from the pilot the first step of the plan was taken they had made contact with the small speedy craft which on a later signal that they had picked up the incoming yacht would speed out to sea to meet her now we'll climb decided sandy climb they did until the sea dropped down to a gray-green flat expanse and only the powerful binoculars larry was using could, could pick out the cruising hydroplane slowly verging away from the shore in an apparently aimless voyage this isn't such a bad scheme at that dick concluded mentally if there should be anybody on the lookout robbers or somebody who wants to see what's going on no one will see any connection between us passing here and then climbing to get a good wind for a run down the coast toward maine and a hydroplane that's acting as if it had some engine trouble higher and higher they went probably out of sight of anyone without strong field glasses and while they swung in a wide circle larry's binoculars swept the horizon smoke he turned the focusing adjustment a trifle too soon to signal it may be an oil-burning steamer and not the yacht or a rum-runner of a revenue patrol it's thick black oil smoke the sort the yacht would give it is a small boat yes his signal relayed through dick and sandy to jeff shifted the gently banked curve into a straighter line and swiftly the lines of the oncoming craft miles away became clear larry verified his decision that the low gray hull with its projecting bowsprit the rakish funnel atop the low trunk of the central cabin and the yacht ensign identified the tramp the signal went forward jeff glancing back caught sandy's nod now we'll dive to where the hydroplane can see us and the dive will signal the yacht that we're the airplane they'll be watching for dick decided the maneuver was executed ending in a fairly tight circle after jeff had skillfully leveled out of the drop smoke was trailing over the yacht's stern sandy murmured now it's blowing off to the starboard side she's swinging toward us through his glasses larry saw the hydroplane awaken the sea to a split crest of foam saw a cascade of moiling water begin to chase her and knew that the tiny craft was racing out to the meeting all's well he grinned as dick looked back dick nodded and passed the report to sandy sandy did not smile instead as they swung he scanned the sky that was not his instructions but it was his determined plan i'll see the amphibian jeff was working on nice he mused it ought to be in sight now convinced that both the hydroplane and the yacht would have located the spot on the sea where they could meet jeff broke the tedium of his tight circle by a reverse of controls banking to the other side and swinging in a climbing spiral to the right closer and closer together came the swift turbine propelled yacht and the surface skimming hydroplane i was right shouted sandy unheard but triumphant and also a little startled that he had so closely guessed what would happen he swung his head signaled dick waved an arm pointing dick and larry stared while sandy poked jeff and repeated his gestures on the horizon coming at moderate speed but growing large enough so that there could be no error of identification came the amphibian its dun color and its tail marking were unmistakable the amphibian cried larry i wonder why i wonder who's in it dick mused as jeff cut the gun and went into a glide the better to get a look at the oncoming craft low over the seashore larry realized with a pang that he was neglecting jeff's plan he looked down no glass was needed to show him the yacht swiftly being brought almost under them by its speed and theirs a quarter of a mile away was the hydroplane coming fast a mile to the south flew the approaching amphibian and in every mind even jeff's had they been able to read it was the puzzled question why jeff began to climb in a tight upward spiral to keep as well over the scene of activity as he could without being in the way 
and to be high enough to interfere if something has slipped larry decided on the purpose in jeff's mind then as the amphibian came roaring up a hundred yards to their left and in a wide swing began to circle the yacht sandy screeched in excitement and pointed downward something's happening he screamed swiftly larry threw his binoculars into focus as he swept the length of the yacht to discover what caused sandy's cry for with a wing in his way he did not see the stern they swung and he gave a shout of dismay and amazement somebody's overboard instantly he corrected himself no but there's a life preserver in the water it was thrown over but the yacht isn't stopping his glasses swept the bridge the deck no excitement now i wonder the lenses brought the stern and after cabin into view turning away back to his view in a dark dress a woman who had been at the extreme after rail was racing out of sight behind the cabin there's a life preserver in the water dick could see it without glasses sandy looked the amphibian is making for it he yelled the hydroplane can't get there in time shouted larry none of them realized that jeff's roaring engine drowned their cries jeff look wildly sandy gesticulated fast and high in a swift glide coming like a hawk dropping to its prey a light seaplane skimming the edge of an incoming fog bank showed its slim boat-like fuselage and wide wingspan with two small pontoons at wingtips to support it in the surf there was a swift drop of their own craft as jeff dived came into a good position and zoomed past the yacht close to it wildly as those on the bridge came into clear view sandy larry dick and jeff gesticulated pointing astern bells were jangled the yacht was sharply brought up by reversed propellers and a tender was swiftly being put down from its davits an excited sailor working to start his engine even as it was lowered then helpless to take active part because they had no pontoons the sky patrol witnessed the maddest strangest race staged since aviation became a reality and the prize a mysteriously flung life preserver End of chapter four chapter five of the haunted hangar by van powell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Five: Mystery in the Fog. While Sandy watched the amphibian and Dick stared at the rapidly approaching seaplane, Larry gazed at the swift hydroplane and noted the feverish attempt on the yacht to get its tender going as it struck the surging water. Swiftly, he snapped the binoculars to his eyes as they receded from the yacht in the onrush of their zoom a woman in dark clothes had rushed behind the after cabin she must have tossed the life preserver from the stern but there was a woman on the bridge with the white uniformed captain and a navigating officer she was in dark clothes but she had been there all the time he suddenly recalled the french maid jeff had mentioned in the hotel that answered his puzzled wonder he knew who had thrown that life preserver at any rate it could not be the mistress it left only the maid to suspect fast as a dart the hydroplane cut the surges she'll get there they see the life preserver he cried looking past the tilting wings as they executed a split s to turn to head back the quickest possible way the amphibian can set down on the water and she'll pass the place already there's somebody climbing out of the front cockpit onto the wing to grab the thing as they pass sandy muttered that seaplane is coming fast mused dick what a race it will be a wonder if there isn't a smash when they all come together it took only seconds for the race to conclude with a warning cry that was drowned by their engine noise larry saw that the amphibian was in such a line of flight that it must be crossed by the course of the hydroplane and from the respective speeds as well as he could judge there might be either a collision or one of the craft must alter its course 
the seaplane is almost down on the water and coming like an arrow toward that white preserver gasped dick will its wings hit the yacht can we do anything at all sandy wondered desperately evidently jeff either caught his thought or decided on a course through his own quick wit opening the throttle full on he kicked rudder and depressed his left wing around came the airplane skidding out of her course from the momentum and the sharp application of control she moved sharply upward and sidewise deftly jeff caught the skid righted sandy exultantly screeched at the maneuver flying fast in a steep descent they went across the nose of the amphibian and in the turmoil of their propeller wash she went almost out of control and before her pilot caught up his stability the hydroplane raced across her path in a slanting line and made for the small round object bobbing in the trough between two swells but that gave the seaplane an advantage quick to take it dipping a wing and kicking rudder the seaplane's pilot swerved a little leveled off and set down in a smother of foam and on his wing also a man climbed close to the tip where's the one who was on the amphibian wing larry wondered in the water spilled by our wash he decided he had no time to pay attention to that situation the imminent culmination of the race chained his gaze the tender is almost there oh gasped sandy the seaplane must be rammed by the tender but the yacht's boat with its motor hastily started and cold lost way as the engine sputtered and died slackening speed the seaplane raced along until with a hand clinging to a brace and his body leaning far over the dancing waves its passenger on the wing scooped up the life preserver almost immediately the seaplane began to get off the water the tender its engine missing badly turned its attention to the man in the water but before it could get to him or near him sandy dick and larry saw that he caught the tail assembly of the amphibian and scrambling over the fuselage as the craft picked up speed fell flat on his stomach just behind the pilot's place and clung tightly while the craft got on the step and went into the air in a swift moil of foam and a roaring of its engine out generated the hydroplane cut speed and swung toward the yacht followed by the tender the race was out of their hands it depends on us panted sandy jeff get after that seaplane their pilot needed no instructions kicking rudder and dipping a wing almost wetting it in the spray of a breaking comber he flung his airplane into a new line of flight reverse controls giving opposite rudder and aileron got his craft on a stable keel and gave it the gun as he snapped up the flippers to lift her nose and climb out to the retreating plane far behind them in their swift chase with every ounce of power put into their engine and their whole hearts urging it to better speed the sky patrol saw the amphibian swerve towards shore and give up the try for whatever that precious life preserver had attached to it that something had been cast overboard tied to the float was obvious to larry dick and sandy nothing else explained its employment what a chase speed was in their favor because the airplane fast as it was lacked the power of their engine which they learned later that jeff had selected for that very quality overhauling the seaplane was not the question their problem was to get above it to ride it down force it to take the sea or to come down in a crack up on shore that must be before it could lose itself in that dull gloomy lowering bank of fog ahead for that fog the seaplane was making at full speed climb jeff sandy begged hoping their pilot could ride down the craft ahead but jeff had a level course he had to in order to maintain the advantage of speed he thought he could get alongside their quarry before the mist swallowed it hit it ended the pursuit in that he was beaten by only a hundred feet into the murky folds of the thick mist dived the seaplane hardly more than two hundred feet behind they felt the cold clammy fingers of the cloud touch their shrinking faces jeff cut the gun they strained their ears where was the seaplane 
would it climb above the murk glide straight through it and down swerve and glide or dive out and risk leveling off and settling down just beneath the bank so that its rapidly coming folds and the silent sea would make a safe and comfortable concealment slowly almost in a graveyard glide so flat was the descent to hold flying speed and stay as high as they could their airplane moved along they listened only the raucous cry of a seagull cut into that chill silence the fog kept its secrets this can't last long for us thought larry we'll be down to the water before we know it much the same idea made dick peer anxiously over the cowling they must be listening for us in the seaplane sandy decided i know there was a pilot and the man who got the life preserver i wish i could have gotten a good look at either one but the pilot had goggles and his helmet to hide his face and the other man had his back turned to us where can they be what are they doing they could not wait for the answer through a thin cleft in the heavy mist not far below them the dark uplines of eel grass flanking two sides of a channel in the swampy shore stood out for an instant clear and menacing jeff warned sandy dick echoed the cry jeff had already caught the threat of that swamp below them they could not risk going a foot lower the pilot opened his throttle picking up climbing speed to the roar of his engine we had to give in first larry decided ruefully not only had they given in jeff it appeared had given up in thickening mist the risks were too great they had given up jeff was climbing for the top of the bank where he could come into the clear get some idea of his location and return to report defeat to the yacht whose captain probably lay too waiting for news nor did jeff again cut the gun to listen oh well dick was always hopeful maybe we'll get a break sooner or later up and still climbing the airplane continued through the fog low banks favored them with suddenly thinning rifts parting overhead they shot out into the clear sunlight beneath stretching up disappointed fingers of murk lay the bank of fog look toward shore screamed sandy End of chapter five Chapter six of The Haunted Hangar by Van Powell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter six. The End of the Chase. Instantly, the situation became clear to the Sky Patrol. Having heard their own engine, the pilot of the seaplane had decided to risk a dash out of the fog and to try to escape. Their own airplane had been headed south down the coast when they climbed above the lower shoreward mist the cry from sandy drew their attention to the seaplane even higher than they were and going fast across the narrow end of the island now we can catch them and ride them down exulted dick jeff dropped a wing sharply kicking rudder at the same time onto the trail swung their craft riding it jeff gave the engine all it would take climbing they're getting ahead getting away from us cried sandy larry more conversant with flying tactics decided that jeff meant to get a higher level than they occupied to outclimb the less flexible seaplane so that he could swoop upon it with the advantage of elevation to help him overtake it into the thousands their altimeter swung its indicator three thousand feet another five hundred four thousand now we must be higher than they are larry muttered jeff for crickety christmas sake catch them jeff leveled and their engine roared in a quartering course evidently making in an airline for some point on the connecticut side of long island sound the seaplane held its way gaining in a very flat descent calculated as sandy could see to bring them either alongside or if fortune favored them on to the tail of the other craft jeff drew closer the seconds slipped by the north shore was almost under them swiftly the distance closed up between the racing flyers they're diving cried sandy something's gone wrong 
dick yelled she's out of control the seaplane sheered to one side in a violent slip as her pilot evidently tried to bank and kick rudder and lost control the seaplane wavered caught itself in a steadier line in the pursuing airplane three youthful faces grew intent what was wrong she's diving screamed sandy something has happened decided larry down almost like a hawk falling to its prey the seaplane went through the still air somebody's on the wing he's jumping clear shouted dick trembling with excitement larry caught up the binoculars they were still too far behind for clear vision unaided by glasses he has that life preserver in one hand there he goes cried dick silhouetted against the northern blue of the sky with a tiny white circle showing sharply in the sunlight the leaping person fell clear of the diving seaplane while larry shaking with excitement tried to focus his glasses and train them on the falling object he's harnessed to a parachute there goes the ripcord sandy would have leapt to his feet but for his restraining safety belt there goes the chute dick was equally thrilled the parachute opened the life preserver snapped out of his hand larry muttered giving up his effort to locate the moving objects in the glass and using his unaided eyes to view the tragedy or whatever it would prove to be the life preserver was jerked away by the jar when the parachute arrested the fall sharply making it impossible for a hand grip to retain the rope of the swiftly plunging white circle why doesn't the other one jump clear dick's heart seemed to be tearing to get out through his tightening throat which one was under the parachute which stayed in the falling seaplane and why an arm of mist swinging far over the land intervened between their vision and the shoreline into it hidden from sight the seaplane flashed through its concealing murk flicked the tiny round object of mystery more deliberately settling down first the hanging bulk of the unknown man then the spreading folds of the parachute drifted into mist and mystery the chase was ended but the mystery had hardly begun end of chapter six chapter seven of the haunted hangar by van powell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Mamperard. Chapter 7. The Swamp Gives Up a Clue. Two courses were offered to the Sky Patrol with Jeff. We can try to drop down into the fog, called Larry to Dick as their pilot, with closed throttle, nose down to get closer to the scene of the tragedy. But we can't sit down or do anything, and we can't see much for the fog, objected Dick i think we ought to go back and drop a note on to the yacht telling the people to come here in a boat larry agreed with this sensible suggestion and dick scribbling a note passed it to sandy after a glance the younger of the trio gave it to jeff the pilot nodded when he read it again the engine roared as they swung around laying a course to take them above the rolling mist toward the end of the island around which or beyond which the yacht should be cruising or waiting it will be hard to find the yacht in this fog sandy mused but as they flew along he with the others scanned the low clouds for some opening rift through which to catch a possible glimpse of the watercraft a slantwise gust of wind crossed the cockpits giving them new hope if a breeze came to blow aside the mist they might have better chances to see the yacht in steadily increasing force and gradually coming oftener the puffs of moving air increased their confidence the fog was thinning under them blowing aside swirling shifting with the breeze from the new direction as they steadily got closer to the end of the island coming over a spot where a break in the cloud showed brown yellow sand and rushing white surf beyond the wide level beach sandy's alert eyes caught sight of something for an instant prodding jeff he indicated the object as jeff swooped lower inspecting dick caught a good glimpse of the tilted quiet focus of sandy's gesture there's the amphibian dick muttered stranded 
cracked up maybe but if we could get down and land we could use her two of us could to go to the swamp and see what's there before anybody else gets to the life preserver the jewels must have been tied to he passed forward through sandy a note jeff agreed made his bank and turn as sandy saw the drift of a plume of smoke on the horizon to get into the wind coming back dropped low jeff scanned the beach it looks safe for a landing pretty solid beach larry concluded and evidently jeff felt the same way for he climbed in his turning bank got the wind right and came down using his engine with partly open throttle to help him settle gradually until the landing wheels touched when the tail dropped smartly the gun was cut and the sand fairly level and reasonably well packed dragged them to a stop hurriedly the youthful sky patrol tumbled onto the sand digging cotton plugs out of their ears now that the roar of the motor no longer made them essential it's the amphibian and no mistake larry cried running down the beach toward the tilted craft if she isn't damaged he told dick you and jeff or jeff and i could fly to the swamp in her you go dick was generous to the friend he admired and who was almost a year older it would need a cool quick head to handle whatever you might find in the swamp you go that also was sandy's opinion when after a rapid inspection they agreed with jeff that the amphibian set down with only a strained tail skid and a burst tire in the landing wheel gear was usable but there's no gas objected larry noting the indicator in the control cockpit see the meter says zero it was that way when i looked before sandy said that was why i didn't think anybody meant to use it easy to fool you on that jeff declared it's been disconnected i wouldn't be surprised if that there tank wasn't nearly half full they had it all fixed and ready let's go then urged larry dick look over the pontoons for strains will you she may have struck one of them she has tipped over part way maybe hit one of the pontoons dick examining with the thoroughness of an expert with jeff's and his chum's life perhaps depending on his care stated that he saw no damage to the waterproofed coverings of the water supports declaring that they would stand by and watch the airplane sandy and dick watched larry and jeff get settled dick spun the propeller to pump gas into the still heated cylinders jeff gave the switch on contact call dick pulling down on the prop sprang aside to avoid its flailing blades and the amphibian's engine took up its roar acting as a ground crew dick righted the craft by thrusting up the wing which was evidently not seriously damaged while sandy as the motor went into its full-throated drone shook the tail to lift the skid out of the clogging sand his eyes shielded from the sand blasted back by the propeller wash he leapt sideways and backward as the elevators lifted the tail and the amphibian shook itself in its forward lunge lifted flew within two inches of the sand and then began to roar skyward he's drawing up the wheels now sandy called to dick they won't be any good with that burst tire he'll have to set down in water anyhow dick explained sandy nodded waving to his two watching comrades as they grew smaller to his peering eyes larry turned his attention to the work of scanning from the forward place all the indented shoreline north that the mist had uncovered to their left as they sped on the lighthouse poked its tower out of the drifting dispelling fog soon jeff dropped low diminished the throb of the engine cruising while larry kept watch yonder it is larry's hand gestured ahead and to the side jeff peering located the wing of the seaplane the fuselage half submerged in muddy channel ooze the tail caught on the matted eelgrass in the mouth of a broad channel they touched water and ran out of momentum with the wings hovering over the grassy bank to either side now what demanded jeff we can't go in any closer already larry had his coat and shoes off stripping them off and with no one to observe 
removing all his clothes he lowered himself on to a pontoon and thence to the water chilly but not too cold on the hot june afternoon striking out with due care not to get caught by any submerged tangle of roots or grasses larry swam the forty feet the pilot's in his cockpit he gasped he's he isn't get that collapsible boat on the back of the tank there urged jeff and come back for me it took inexperienced larry some time to open and inflate the tubular rubber device used for supporting survivors of any accident to the seaplane while afloat he's i think he's alive jeff declared fifteen minutes later that's a bad slam he's had on the forehead though he lifted the silent pilot's bruised head put a hand on his heart nodded hopefully and bade larry dash water in the man's face the cold salty liquid seemed at first to have no effect he must have hit himself trying to get out larry surmised jeff shook his head his parachute isn't loosened or unfolded he responded working to get the spark of life to awaken in the man he bent over no larry from the looks of things somebody hit him while they were away up in the air and jumped with that life preserver where is he now if only i could get my hands on him i wonder who it was jeff paid no attention to larry's natural anger and wonder he's coming around fella who did this here to you the eyes fluttered open the lips trembled larry clinging to a brace his feet set on a strut bent closer what happened who done this repeated jeff the man before he sank again into silence uttered one word or half a word gassed he muttered gassed was it somebody named gaston asked jeff the man did not respond never mind larry urged can you get him into the boat somehow jeff you ought to land him at a hospital or at the nearest airport there's a medical officer at every one for crack-ups or fly and telephone for help would you be afraid to stay here if, if i take him to an airport no declared larry stoutly without further words or conscious movements from the silent pilot they managed to get him unhooked from his belt and parachute harness to lower him precariously limp into the rubber boat which larry held on to as jeff half supporting his inert co-pilot propelled it to their own craft as they moved slowly along larry fending off a clump of tough grass into which the breeze sought to drift their rubber shell caught sight of something dimly white far in among the muddy grass roots he left his support swam across the smaller channel carefully and secured the life preserver which had dropped into a heavy clump of the grass and then had floated free of the mud held only by the end of a tangled string and the skin of an empty oilskin pouch torn and ripped to tatters that hung to the cord when larry rejoined jeff he flung the life preserver into the space behind the control seat of the amphibian leaving it there without comment as he helped jeff to lift and drop the still unconscious man into his own forward place then pushing off in the rubber boat he sat still his dry clothes in a compact bundle in the boat thwarts while jeff let the wind and tide run carry his amphibian out of the channel to where he could get sea space for a start to get the amphibian pontoons on the step from which with a silent cargo of human tragedy jeff lifted into air and went out of sight southbound sitting until he dried larry donned his garments gassed he murmured gassed had he heard any name around the airports like gaston well he reflected it's something now anyway we can look for a frenchman and learn if there's one named gaston he sculled back to get under the shading up-tilted wing of the seaplane studying what he saw on its half-submerged afterplace glory gosh he exclaimed staring there neatly arranged was the row of chewed bits of gum end of chapter seven chapter five of 
the haunted hangar by van powell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. chapter eight sandy meets a suspect hello boys sandy and dick standing by the airplane on the beach whirled to see a short stoutish man in regulation flying togs come unexpectedly into view from behind an inshore hillock of sand as i live and breathe the man continued i'm seeing things his gaze was bent on the aircraft sandy discerned instantly that he was looking at the pilot who had handled the control job on the amphibian during the recent excitement the stranger had a pleasant round face with eyes that twinkled in spite of the creases around them that showed worry no wonder he was worried sandy thought having deserted the craft they had foiled in its attempt to get the gems the man had returned from some short foray to discover his craft replaced by another howdy dick greeted the stranger in reply to his exclamation no sir you're not seeing things at least you're not if you mean the airplane near where the amphibian was sandy wanted to nudge his comrade to warn him to be careful there was no chance the man was observing them intently amphibian you know the different types eh may i ask if you belong around here and if not how you got here and who took the fib unable to check deck his younger chum had to stand listening while dick related some of their most recent adventures as i live and breathe so you're two of the lads who were in the other crate where's the third and was that jeff with you i thought it must be superstitions and all chuckled dick dick judged the man to be both friendly and all right from his pleasant affable manner and his evident knowledge of their pilot's identity not so sandy his mind leapt through a multitude of theories and of suspicions this man might be in cahoots with jeff and sandy was determined not to take jeff or anyone else at face value too readily the whole strange affair looked queer to him jeff had falsified the true reason for the landing in the everdale field he might falsify other things his real reason for flying out to the yacht this man might be his partner in some hidden scheme even the everdale emeralds sandy decided might be just made up nothing has been what it seemed to be he mentally determined i wish dick would be careful what he says since dick had already given the man a sidelight on jeff's character by mentioning his superstitions it occurred to sandy that he might learn from the stranger's reply how well he knew jeff his expression as sandy watched narrowly became one of amusement he smiled broadly threw back his head and as he answered dick's phrase about superstitions and all he laughed he must have walked under a ladder from the way things have turned out he said amusedly who are you please sandy shot the question out suddenly me oh did the man hesitate sandy wondered it seemed to be so before he continued i'm everdale mr everdale even dick questioning as he repeated the name was a little doubtful why i thought mr everdale was in california so i was but one of my airliners brought me across in record time anybody could have learned that the millionaire was in california sandy reflected it would be easy for a clever jewel robber one of a band to impersonate the man when he was caught off guard by their exchange of aircraft if you boys were with jeff you must be all right the man advanced hand extended dick shook it warmly sandy's grip was less cordial but he played the part of an unsuspecting youth as well as he could by finishing the handshake with a tighter grip and a smile i thought jeff might be in the ship yonder until he nearly threw us out of control with his propeller washed then i thought he might be he hesitated he thought you might be dick smiled as he made the response winking broadly sandy wished his chum would be more careful the man who called himself mr everdale nodded as long as you're not and i'm not but neither of us cared to say he turned toward the airplane 
let's get together i'm here because my passenger a buddy of mine wrenched his shoulder climbing back into the fib and we sat down here so i could leave him at the fishing shack yonder and go back to see what was what he was in too bad shape to take chances if i felt called on to do any stunts i thought i could take the air in time to catch that seaplane coming out of the fog but it fooled me i already know why you're here he added suppose we hop off in jeff's crate and give a look-see if your friend and my war buddy need any help you can't set down if they do objected sandy his confidence in the man's possible guilt shaken by his knowledge of jeff's war record i don't see for my part why jeff didn't use the amphibian in the first place i wondered about that when i got in at the estate soon after you left mr everdale or the man who claimed to be the millionaire asserted i could see he had been working on it getting it ready he even had the tank full up but he had disconnected the fuel gauge to fool anybody who might be looking around i guess maybe he landed and changed his mind about using it dick suggested on account of taking us in we organized a sort of sky patrol to oversee things but everything went wrong that accounts for it i didn't know he was going to make the hop or i might not have come myself but now well the man broke off his phrase and started to clamber into the control seat let's get going and leave your passenger he is comfortable lying quiet in the fishing shack sandy who had spoken felt his suspicions returning at the reply could there be any reason why they must not identify the other man might he be the ringleader or have some outstanding mark that they had seen before and might recognize dick performed the mech's duties for the pilot in getting the engine started again then he clambered into his old place sandy was already behind their new pilot whoever and whatever he is sandy mused he knows how to lift a crate out of the sand the man claiming to be mr everdale made a skilful getaway from the beach and it took them very little time to get over the marsh already free of fog dick located the crack up sandy indicated the spot and the pilot dropped so low that his trucks almost grazed the waving eelgrass there's no amphibian in sight though dick murmured i wonder i see larry you who sandy shouted larry in his rubber boat just having given up trying to explain how a number of bits of chewing gum had transferred themselves from the amphibian where last he saw them or some like them to the seaplane gestured and pantomimed to try to tell them his news flying past they could not fully understand the new pilot waved a reassuring glove at larry and swerved back toward the end of the island larry wondered who he was and what his comrades were doing with him but larry always practical let the questions wait for their eventual answers and continued to study the half-sunken seaplane no new clues offered themselves he detached one of the hard adhering chunks of gum and dropped it into his pocket just in case he said half grinning just in case they transfer themselves somewhere else i'll leave twenty-nine of them and see the supposed mr everdale scribbled a note which he handed back to sandy who caught his idea of dropping instructions on the deck of the yacht borrowing dick's jackknife for a weight sandy prepared the message cruising slowly the yacht came into sight their pilot was skilful at coursing in such a direction and at such a height that he could skim low over the watercraft's radio mast and come almost to stalling speed while sandy cast the note overside dick who had caught up larry's abandoned binoculars saw as they zoomed and climbed that a sailor had rescued the note before it bounded over the cabin roof and deck into the sea at once the hydroplane was manned and sent away the yacht took up its own course and mr everdale to give him his own claim title pointed the airplane's nose for his estate sandy occupied the time of the flight by trying to piece together the strangely mixed jigsaw bits of their puzzle or was it only one puzzle by the time they sighted the hangar and field he had all the bits joined perfectly sandy's solution fitted every point that he knew 
and was so water-tight and so beautiful that he landed with his face carrying its first really satisfied and exultant grin the beautiful part of it to sandy was that he could sit by and watch do nothing except pay out rope and let them tie themselves up in it for sandy's suspects would certainly incriminate themselves let them guy me and call me suspicious sandy he murmured as he followed dick toward the wharf on the inlet by the shore of the estate if i untangle this snarl the way i expect to i may not bother to go in for airplane engineering there might be as much money in a private detective office mr everdell proceeded at once to tie himself in his first knot well mm -hmm, he remarked to dick it feels good to be on the old place again first time i've set foot on it for three years and he told us on the beach he'd been here this morning sandy whispered to himself he decided to pay out another bit of rope mrs everdale will be glad you're here when she lands he remarked the man whirled frowning hesitated and then spoke very emphatically look here boys he said earnestly don't say a word to her about me i won't be here when she lands and i don't want it known i'm in the east there's a good reason i'll bet there is sandy said to himself End of chapter eight chapter nine of the haunted hangar by van powell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter nine jeff encounters a jinx turning with a confidential air and addressing dick for whom he seemed to have the greater liking mr everdell spoke i've just thought of a good scheme as jeff and uh, taken you into his confidence any sandy helpless to interfere heard dick give the substance of what they had learned from the superstitious pilot the man continued that lets me snap right down to my plan now we don't know where those emeralds are we don't know which people use the seaplane or whether the man who jumped has them and has gotten away or not but if i should fade out of sight and no one but my dependable sky patrol knows i'm around your dependable sky patrol sandy thought going to try to use us now well if no one else knows i'm around i can watch and see a lot that others might miss i'm going to have that seaplane brought here and then i'll be around watching to see who comes snooping if anybody does as i live and breathe i think that's a great idea don't you dick agreed readily all right then you can tell your other comrade larry you said you call him dick i'll leave a note for jeff now i'll go on up to the house and write it and make a couple of telephone calls and then i'll drop out of things but you'll hear from me off and on till we get those emeralds safe in our hands then even while we're waiting if you can get your parents consent to stay which i think can be arranged by jeff larry can take some flying navigation you dick can study engines and construction or navigation whatever you like he put a hand on sandy's shoulder and the latter managed not to wince or draw away sandy can have the run of my library full of books on engineering and mechanics and you'll be learning while you help me get those emeralds and find out who flew the seaplane and who helped them on the yacht i know i can get my father's consent to visit you here dick said eagerly and i like the plan he added heartily sandy watching their confident stroll toward the closed mansion turned a cold face to dick you're a fine sky patrol he grumbled you swallow everything he said like a big softy and told him everything you knew he continued bitterly why not dick wanted to know you wait till larry comes and i tell him my theory all right dick agreed cheerfully but don't start in earning your nickname all over again he warned i'll have you calling me successful sandy before i'm through the drone of an incoming airplane took them racing to the landing spot where jeff came down to report 
that he had taken the unconscious seaplane pilot to a hospital where it was declared that he had a bad blow on his temple and might not recover his mental clearness for many days and i'm glad i'm done with this here amphibian he added had more trouble than i ever had before i think the crates hoodooed maybe the ghost haunting the hangar put a spell on it dick chuckled well don't worry jeff you're down safe and sandy shook his head let them take jeff up to the house he decided and watch the two men when they met dick not comprehending the idea behind sandy's head shake nevertheless did not finish his sentence the roar of a motorboat began to attract their attention and as they went to the wharf again jeff wanted explanations of how they got in with the airplane you won't make me believe dick flew that there crate he declared no dick agreed i didn't you'll find the man who did up at the house jeff swerved aside on a gravel path leaving them to aid the caretaker and his mechanic to bring the hydroplane to its mooring and let larry jump out to join them they compared notes eagerly dick and sandy could hardly forego interrupting one another as they brought their story up to the minute after hearing how larry had helped to get the pilot to the amphibian discovering and rescuing the life preserver on the way now larry dick said finally mr everdale said we could take you into our confidence and he's probably telling jeff everything suspicious sandy has a theory all worked out i suppose jeff is a double-dyed villain and this mr everdale will turn out it's no joking matter sandy spoke sharply you listen to my idea and see what you think jeff the so-called mr everdale and the pilot and passenger of the seaplane as well as the presumably injured man whom they had not seen all these were members of an international band of robbers sandy claimed the man who jumped with the parachute and life preserver must be named gaston from what the pilot said to you larry he went on then he must be french maybe dick said most likely he is agreed larry but if he was wait till i get to that urged sandy well they learned somehow that mr everdale was in california and his wife was taking the emeralds to london they didn't have any conspirator on the yacht then or else they would have gotten the real emeralds long ago so there was just those five in the band jeff mr everdale gaston the man we haven't seen and the injured pilot there might have been two gangs one of three one of three one of two or three bands one of two one of two one of one don't poke fun at him dick he argues reasonably so far thanks larry sandy was grateful all right then the band planned the work in london at the hotel that's how jeff knew the emeralds were imitations they poured acid on did they carry acid just in case dick could not restrain his tendency to tease i think it was something they meant to throw on anybody who tried to stop them golly gracious that might be larry exclaimed anyhow they discovered the false emeralds and tried to destroy them sandy was more confident at larry's acceptance of his ideas they managed to get somebody on the yacht sandy guessed and then to be sure there was no hitch divided into three groups jeff possibly the ringleader after all in his airplane two in the seaplane the other two in the amphibian the confederate on the yacht was to secure the gems somehow and they must have had a radio somewhere to get messages larry was beginning to see daylight and to concur with sandy's opinions yes sandy nodded and they all went to the appointed place but jeff interfered with the amphibian objected dick and you forget to account for the two men in the hydroplane i think it came out the way it does in books sandy declared each set wanted those emeralds and they tried to outdo one another and maybe the hydroplane was the honest one of the lot with mr everdale's the real one's caretaker summoned by the captain but jeff had us signal them dick said they must know jeff added larry i know how that fits 
sandy spoke earnestly the hydroplane men were honest and jeff worked into their confidence and offered to help them to discover the plan well that's possible larry admitted we know what happened jeff signaled but he knew the amphibian was coming and the seaplane to make sure neither would break down and leave him helpless while he supervised sandy had good going now the seaplane got the life preserver and then jeff decided that they might get away tried to follow and while the seaplane was flying his passenger got the emeralds free of the life preserver and then now you're stalled chuckled dick but sandy was not defeated the passenger while they were high up through something and hit the pilot the seaplane went out of control the man jumped and then cut free his parachute cut the sack holding the emeralds and hit in the swamp why wouldn't he take the rubber boat it would be missed larry he was too bright for that how could he get away why dick wait till everybody was gone then take to the rubber boat get himself picked up if the boat isn't there when they bring up the seaplane i'll think you've hit the nail on the head larry conceded i know i have Shh. here comes jeff larry turned well jeff he says you know all about him but he was gone when i got this here note he failed to display the missive to sandy's disappointment it would have provided a fine chance to compare the writing with what he had seen in the letters supposed to have come from california and if he was really flying east why had mr everdale written a letter by mail would be slower than an airplane flight i don't like this plan at all at all jeff went on dubiously that seaplane is jinxed oh sh jeff i don't care larry listen she cracked up and her pilot got a bad smash from something and the emeralds vanished we recovered the life preserver anyhow chuckled dick and here comes the yacht so we can return that much property i tell you the sky patrol has accomplished something jeff did not share larry's smile he imitated sandy's scowl he says for me to shove my crate in the hangar stay there get your parents to let you make a visit and larry learn flying and so on but if i put my crate in that hangar it's haunted and now the jinx seaplane to come in any instruction i give will be at your own risk i'm not worrying larry said and say here's a queer one jeff changed the subject i noticed some chunks of gum wasn't in the amphibian did you take em out when you stayed back in the hangar sandy no or if he did somebody else put the same kind in the seaplane as larry spoke he withdrew from his pocket a dark hard object get that here cried sandy snatching at it he tore at the hard substance with fingernails working it flatter and then with an exultant screech boy-like but not good practice for an amateur detective he pointed to something dark green glowing there's one of the everdale emeralds he exulted End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of The Haunted Hangar by Van Powell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Ten Larry's Capture. How did you ever guess the gem was in the gum? Dick stared admiringly at Sandy, exultantly at the green light flashing from that hidden emerald as Sandy scraped aside the clinging substance from it first the gum was in the amphibian sandy said trying to be as modest as the discovery would let him then it was gone we thought we saw somebody in the hangar when first we went in but he got away somehow then we saw the amphibian flying and it flashed over me that whoever we had seen before had been working on the amphibian and had chewed up all those pieces of gum but i didn't see why he had left it there then when we found out that the man calling himself everdale didn't look for or miss the gum i guessed that he hadn't been the gum chewer but who had then 
i wondered and why it must have been for some reason because if he had found the gum when he came to play ghost keep everybody away from the estate by scaring them and get the amphibian ready he'd have thrown any gum he'd found into the waste can the gum was there for some reason i agreed dick this is one time when being suspicious has paid he added yes sandy admitted when the life preserver was found and no gems were in the oil skin tied to it and dick showed me the gum the reason for the big chunks of old gum came to me the passenger had been getting it ready he had to chew a great lot to get enough we mustn't waste any more time cried larry eagerly there are twenty-nine more chunks in the seaplane let's fly there jeff and get it that there is good sense jeff started toward the flying field the fellow we didn't find might come back for the emeralds going with them to help out dick told larry that he proposed to go at once to the various airports and flying fields to learn if he could who had engaged the seaplane the new floyd bennett field is the best chance argued jeff they have got water and seaplane facilities there it's on barren island and that's where a man could have gone and about the time between your seeing the spook and the time the seaplane got where the yacht was i'll wait for the yacht sandy said accompanying them mrs everdale will be glad to see what i discovered that gave each of the members of the sky patrol something to do dick had no difficulty in learning when he got the executives of bennett field interested that the seaplane was an old one belonging to a commercial flying firm operating from the airport the pilot who handled the control job the field manager told him was a stunt man who has been hanging around since he stunted on our opening day i've questioned some of the pilots for you but no one seems to know who the pilot had with him a stranger one says that brought dick's quest to a dead stop sandy had even less success although in the short time since his disappearance the supposed impersonator of mr everdale could not have gone far he was not to be discovered by any search sandy could make farmhouses had no new boarders the house on the estate searched with youthful vim and alert thoroughness revealed no observable hiding places sandy finally gave up the arrival anchoring and debarkation of its people by the yacht allowed him to meet and to reassure mrs everdale and captain parks besides these two he met the almost hysterical french maid mimi also mrs everdale's companion and cousin who had travelled with her a quiet competent nurse and attendant whose lack of funds compelled her to serve as a sort of trained nurse for the millionaire's wife who was of a very nervous sickly type in spite of everybody's relief when sandy displayed the emerald the elderly trained nurse and companion insisted that mrs everdale must retire rest and recover from her recent exciting experience sandy left alone searched the hangar for an unseen exit but found none landing the amphibian at almost the same spot they had set down before jeff looked around for the rubber boat they had left tied to a sunken snag i guess sandy's ideas were right after all decided larry as he saw that the small water conveyance was not there sandy had claimed that if the missing seaplane passenger had hidden during the recent search of the seaplane the boat would aid him to escape from the otherwise water and swamp bound place if the rubber boat's gone jeff commented the twenty-nine other emeralds of the thirty on the necklace they're gone too i'll have to swim over again and see larry stripped and made the short water journey you're still here he shouted across the channel jeff who had kept his engine idling decided to risk a closer approach in the amphibian his lower wingspan barely cleared the tops of grass clumps i guess there aren't any snags to rip the pontoons larry assured him to get closer would save larry many trips to and fro in the water fine larry commented as the amphibian moving cautiously came close enough for him to catch a rope 
and put a loop around the closest truss of the submerged seaplane thus he was able to pass the chunks of gum to jeff who had his clothes on and pockets for storage while the transfer was being made the amphibian's engine died with unexpected suddenness golly gracious larry exclaimed i'll bet she's out of gas can't tell by the gauge ruefully jeff upbraided his stupidity in forgetting to see if they had to gas up before the take-off from the estate now what's to do he wondered larry too saw a number of difficulties perhaps more than did jeff because from larry's point of view due to sandy's suspicion of the superstitious pilot jeff must not go free with the gems in his pockets nor did larry dare be the one to go if he did jeff might be playing a trick let him get beyond chance of return in time use some reserve gas and fly away i can't swim jeff began considering the ways of escape to some place where they could secure a supply boat with fuel i wouldn't chance swimming all the way down the swamps to the nearest village on shore larry said quietly this here is a fix that is a fix morosely jeff summed up the situation here we are with a pocket full of emeralds and no gas and no way to get any and if anybody knows the gems are in this gum we'd be helpless if they wanted to take them larry did not answer he was mentally going over the seemingly unbreakable deadlock one thing that kept coming into his mind was the strange fact that if the disappearing passenger of the seaplane had taken the rubber boat he had not also taken the hidden jewels he must have known something about them or guessed he reflected if they were put in the gum while they were flying unless it was done while they were in the fog but even then he knew all that excitement meant something i don't understand it he didn't know because he must have hired the pilot and the seaplane to get the emeralds still in that case he mused if the man had known where the gems were why hadn't he inflated the rubber boat and taken them all in the first escape a possible solution came to him saying nothing to jeff he bent his whole power of thinking on the more important discovery of a way to get fuel climbing on to the amphibian and dressing he considered that matter without arriving at any workable solution his eyes rested for a moment on the upthrust wing of the submerged seaplane his face changed expression an idea flashed across his mind jeff he cried do you suppose we could make a gas line from the brass tubing on the seaplane what for see that wing he pointed it sticks up and is higher than our own tank and if there's a wing tank and i think a seaplane would have them why didn't i think of that grinned jeff i wouldn't be surprised if that there is right he carefully climbed out onto the amphibian's lower wing till he could grip a guy wire on the seaplane by agility and a good deal of scuffling with some damage to the doped fabric of the seaplane got into the partly sunken pilot seat and from that climbing up sent a quick glance over the cockpit tracing the fuel lines right as can be he called now if i can find a wrench and get loose some brass tubing can i help jeff bent down in the pilot seat lifted his head shaking it stay where you are he called two might push the crate down into the mud too fast for safety she's half a foot deeper in than when we were here before i'll manage shutting off the governing valve jeff began unscrewing the pipelines rejoining lengths of piping until with a section from the carburetor to give the needed length he passed over a makeshift path for the wing tank gas to flow by gravity into their own craft all ready called larry bending the end of the line so its flow went into the central tank of the amphibian jeff opened the gas valve under the wing tank here she comes larry was exultant we'll get enough to hop down the shore to a fuel supply anyhow jeff said the gauges were out of commission and they had to figure the amount they secured from the size of the pipe and time that the gas flowed i guess that's all about seven gallons said jeff 
as the last drops fell into their tank larry threw aside the useless pipe sent home the tank cap and dropped down into the after seat to be sure the ignition was off before jeff swung the propeller sturdily to suck the gas into the cylinders so intent had they been on the business of the gas transfer that as jeff swung the prop both were taken by surprise when a curt voice came from close under the amphibian's tail assembly put your hands up both of you quick a man coming silently from some concealment in a dory undetected in their busy absorption held something menacingly business-like and sending sun glints from its blue steel its hollow nose covered both at the range he had up went larry's hands jeff also elevated his own now remarked the stranger pulling the dory around without losing his advantage both turn your backs and clasp your hands behind you wait said larry suddenly earnestly i'll give you the jewels without making any trouble if you let me put my hand in my pocket i'll throw the emeralds down to you the man stared amazed either incredulous or not quite understanding larry had no emeralds and was well aware of it jeff still made his pockets bulge with the packed chunks of gum but larry had seen a chance that they might turn to their own advantage if once the man's eyes could be diverted from jeff just before he had clambered onto the forward bracing to spin the amphibian's propeller jeff had laid down the sturdy wrench he had used for bending the pipes evidently he meant to transfer it to his own tool kit but had wished to start the amphibian's engine first the wrench within his reach could be used as a weapon larry had caught jeff's flash of the eyes toward it as his hands had been elevated from jeff's expression larry saw out of the corner of his eye that the older pilot caught the younger comrade's purpose all right the man had recovered his surprised wits and was closely watching larry which pocket this one larry carefully keeping fingers spread wide tapped one side of his coat throw the package or whatever it is jeff's hand was quietly coming down it stuck larry began to tug with his hand in his inside pocket where he pretended the jewels were no monkey shines warned the stranger watching closely jeff's hand flashed down the wrench with a twisting underhand fling spun through the air jeff dropped into the cockpit the wrench struck hitting the man's arm and deflecting the muzzle of his weapon as it exploded but he did not drop it in that split minute of time larry was on the cockpit seat and plunged in a swift slantwise leap down upon the man in the dory his unexpected assault was executed so rapidly that the man had not time to recover from the surprise and get his weapon trained before larry was on him sending him sprawling backward oh my shoulder the man cried out in sudden anguish larry startled seeing the pain in the face just under his own relaxed for an instant only being sure that his quick grip on the wrist holding the weapon in its hand was not released oh the man groaned and dropping his weapon he began to nurse his shoulder larry suspected some trick but there was none the man tamely surrendered as he nursed his painful muscles a sudden misgiving came over larry the man he recalled in pulling with his arm had winced before he got the dory where he wanted it his cry his subsequent favoring of his shoulder told larry the truth you're the man who was in the amphibian when mr everdell flew it he said how did you get here with your injured shoulder tide brought me through a channel i felt better saw a spare dory and watched some debris on the water and reckoned the tide would get me to where i could see where the amphibian set down i saw it hop off the beach saw it disappear heard it and saw it coming back and was curious but how did you know about mr everdell and who was in the seaplane and in the other crate i saw here comes the tug and floating crane to salvage the seaplane said jeff you'll have to stay in the tug deckhouse till we get the straight of this and for holding a gun on us you can explain to the police maybe as for us we don't need to explain and as later 
he and larry resumed their places in the amphibian larry's captive remained under guard on the tug End of chapter 10